Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Tuesday Night Edition. This is our last of 2023. Our topic is new pharmaceuticals and their clinical applications, and it will be aptly and ably brought to us by Dr. Paul Karpecki. He received his OD degree from Indiana University, and he did a fellowship in medical coordinate in Kansas City in, in his affiliation with Pennsylvania College of Optometry. He currently serves as Director of Coordinate External Disease for the Kentucky Eye Institute in Lexington, Kentucky. And he runs the largest referral-only ocular surface disease clinic in the U.S. He's also an associate professor at the Kentucky College of Optometry at University of Pikeville. In 2019 through 2017 through 19, he completed a two-year preceptorship in advanced retinal disease at Retinal Associates for Kentucky. And he is a chief medical editor for a review of optometry, chairs the new technology and treatment conferences, and serves on the board of the charitable organization Optomet Optometry Giving Sight. Paul is a great friend, a great person, uh, a fascinating person, and a tr tremendous educator. I think we're very lucky to have him. So it's my great pr privilege, and, and everybody else's great privilege, to see and hear Dr. Paul Karpecki. So Paul, please take it away. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, you guys are just such wonderful people to work with, great colleagues. It's always so professionally done, uh, so easy to be assimilated. Vanessa's always there to kind of ask with plenty of time to put things together. You, you, you run a class organization. I'm honored to get to uh, participate and provide a, a webinar. And thank you for all those who are on the call. Busy time of year, and yet you're making time, which says a lot about you and uh, and, and your continuing advancement within your career. And also, you know, obviously, as mentioned, season's greetings, happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, uh, great time of year. So I'm honored to get to um, present on a topic that I think always has an impact simply because this is our opportunity to prescribe new things. And when you have the likes of, of Greg and Joe, you have to make this kind of a interactive session because there's just too much knowledge um, in that crew to not interact with them. And there are some new drugs in glaucoma, like Iusa and things like that. I got to remember the name, or I should say CE. So it should be uh, uh, preservative free latanoprost. So, uh, you know, where I would need their help and, and insights even more so. So we'll we'll cover all that together and, and go through this. And, and I'll begin with my disclosures. These are companies over the last five years. That's a little long, I know. Many of these companies may not even exist, like Acorn, a list. Uh, actually, I got to get this updated. I, I bet a third of these don't even apply. But nevertheless, I, at least it's thorough. There's no more Cala Pharmaceuticals. There's no more uh, Acorn. There's no more Airy. Uh, but nevertheless, you get an idea of things I've done in the last five years, most of it research um, as well. But I apologize. I need to get that updated as that truly is kind of old. But nevertheless, let's go. Uh, at least the pertinent ones for today have been reconciled that are on there, but many of these companies are way beyond anything that you could work with because they don't exist. Let's get into this. Uh, let's start with a case. I think that's a good way to begin and just ensure we're on track with our understanding of, of different new drugs. And I'm going to try and do anything that got approved within about three years and a peek into some of the things that might get approved within the next year, two at the most. So let's start with this 44-year-old female patient coming in uh, with kind of a unique punctate epithelial keratitis on her cornea. Now, the history, I think, really gives her points in the direction you would want to go for treating this, history of HSV in the right eye, uh, diabetes for over 10 years a, uh, with peripheral neuropathy in her fingers and her feet. Uh, unresponsive to therapy, she, I, will, I wouldn't say non-responsive. I would put like a, an amniotic membrane and she would actually get a response. But then, you know, three to six months later, she'd kind of look like this again. And, and her recurring symptoms would come in. And ironically, you look at this cornea and you think, wow, kind of a small, tear, thin tear meniscus looks like maybe some dry eye. But that punctate epithelial keratitis is pretty confluent and dense. Her only symptoms are blurred vision and some mild light, photo, light sensitivity or photophobia. So that probably may help too, as you're figuring out your diagnosis. So we touch the oh, lower I turn off the volume here. Cornea, not the limbus. And That's not all the right. Pupil. Do you feel that at all? No. Nothing. 
Yeah, most people have you poked that's, in the eye with a. That's just the, the beginning. Of course, I'm going to test all five areas, but. Really jump out of their chair. So obviously, I'm doing a dental floss for for light for sensitivity of the cornea or aesthesia. You're not seeing obviously even a blink reflex. Normally, I grade from a one to four. So I will I will touch the inferior cornea as you see there. Uh, some people like cotton wisp. I like dental floss because if you buy the uh, research Cochet Bonnet esthesiometer, say you do a lot of research and you have the one that they require for studies, it really has kind of an acrylic filament in it, which is a little bit like the old cheap dental floss. So I just get that old cheap stuff. I hold it kind of about an inch away. This is a little further, but normally about an inch away from the end. And I touch six o'clock, three o'clock, nine, 12, and then I finish in the center. And the reason I don't do the center first is because it seems like when they see it coming at them, they often feel like they should say they feel it. So I find that if I kind of sneak up in fairly and ask them, I go from there. But I will, I've had patients where one area is very sensitive and other areas really don't have any sensitivity. So it's important to test more than just one zone. If they don't even blink, then that's a, a zero sensitivity. If they don't feel it, but they blink, they have a blink reflex, that's a one. If they feel it, but they're not jumping out of the chair, that's a two, and then three is full sensitivity. So obviously we're looking at zero to one in this patient. Not much going on um, as far as that, which is surprising, but it's not because of the fact that she didn't really have a lot of symptoms. So you probably guessed the diagnosis here, neurotrophic keratitis. I think when you look at the, the nerve breakdown of this disease, an impaired trigeminal nerve, it starts to make you realize that you got to have some sort of a history. <clears throat> you have to have a patient who, you know, may have diabetes with, with peripheral neuropathy. They don't have to have the peripheral neuropathy to have uh, neurotrophic keratitis, but they do go together a lot of times. You, you probably have had to have some surgery that nick that trigeminal nerve you see on the right. Uh, multiple surgeries of the eye could do it. One is rare to do it. It could, but it's pretty rare. Multiple is not. Other conditions that you might think of could be a stroke, uh, you know, where you're getting an effect there. And of course, the herpetic disease, zoster or shingles, uh, simplex all come into play. And when the trigeminal nerve is affected, it affects kind of a lot of things. Think about all that the trigeminal nerve does. It's responsible for where your eyes are looking, your extraocular muscle movement. It's responsible for your proprioceptive perception. That is the efferent branch tells the brain where you're looking. It's responsible for your blink your tear reflex, your lacrimal, your mucin as well. It is responsible for your your trophic supply or your, your nutrients that come into play. So if you lose that, you're going to get a, eventually some dry eye level, perhaps. You're definitely going to get some lack of meibomian gland function because you don't have the blink. But the main thing is the impairment of the trophic supply, the nutrients that go to those epithelial cells. And then obviously you get corneal epithelial alterations or breakdown. Uh, you get poor healing. So the eye, it's like the brain doesn't get the response from the eye to say, hey, you need to heal this up. And so nothing's healing. And you get a reduced tear film and the lack of blink, which then probably accelerates this. Although there aren't many fast neurotrophic keratitises. So accelerating a very, very slow condition, I guess is a good way of putting it. And then you have the breakdown and eventually the neurotrophic keratitis. So you have to have three things. You have to have a reason um, and we just talked about all of them, even long-term prostaglandin use or preserves have been shown to cause some neurotrophic effects. So you could have other reasons beyond the more common ones like diabetes or herpetic disease or surgery that cuts the nerve. You got to have some sort of, you know, signs that say, hey, this is, this is something abnormal, PEK, persistent epithelial <laughs> defect, ulcer. And then you have to have you know, the non-nerve function, those three, there's some way to test with a cotton wisp or dental floss, the cheap dental floss, the three for a dollar, some way to kind of test if, if indeed there are no sensations going on there. And that's your, pretty much your, your definition that comes to play. Now there are three stages of neurotrophic keratitis before we get into the new, the new therapeutics. Uh, you know, it's kind of an oxymoron. Stage one is called mild, mild, Neurotrophic keratitis is like the worst looking dry eye you've ever seen. Like this patient, you saw all that confluent staining. That'd be considered a stage one or mild. So I don't really like mild, moderate, severe. 
for NK. It just doesn't seem to fit with the severity of the disease. I do like stages though, because if you have stage one, it means if I don't do something about this, you'll go to stage two. And if there's a stage two, then there's a stage three. So it, it imparts a need for, hey, let's take care of this in some way. Stage one means there's no areas of pooling of your fluorescein, but there is a lot of staining across the cornea, like the worst, as I said, looking dry eye. Stage two is pooling because you have a persistent corneal epithelial defect. And stage three is an ulcer. And again, the difference from an ulcer, as you all know from a persistent epithelial defect, is now you're losing stroma. So it's a lot deeper of a tissue loss. Fascinating though, the most common symptom in all of these conditions is actually that blurred vision or vision loss. In the first cases, you know, it's just not good vision. Persistent epithelial defects do tend to be central. They don't have to be, but typically lose vision. And then an ulcer is going to be a significant loss of vision. So each of these, you know, play a role in that format. The um, So some potential vision loss um, is, is kind of common in all stages. And then it can get to profound when you get to an ulcer. Any comments from Joe, Greg, and you're making a diagnosis of neurotrophic keratitis, things that you look for? Well, Paul, really, I think you covered it. Uh, you covered it very well. You know, it's interesting how this is, I think, kind of overlooked. People look at it as really bad dry eye, and if they don't do the corneal sensitivity testing, they're going to miss this. And you know, historically, until we had some, uh, we ha we had some advancements. You know, people would throw tears and tears and tears at it, and that really didn't, you know, really didn't do much. Maybe. A mild case, it kind of helped a little bit, but now you know you mentioned the amniotic membrane. I think that's a that's a great option uh, or interme intermediary step. But I think you've really touched a lot of things in there, and I think it's great to bring it to people's attention that you know it's easy to test for, and if you get that lack of sensitivity, you get a really severe disease, and this is a person who is really equivalent to advanced glaucoma with an uncontrolled intraocular pressure. It's going to kind of end up in almost the same thing, profound vision loss. Great analogy. Yeah. I just want to echo just, you know, kind of what you and Joe said is, you know, you have these patients that maybe had symptoms of dry eye or some type of symptoms, and now they don't. It's that stain without pain, and their body has down-regulated because it really wasn't, uh, you know, the body tried fixing it. doesn't like pain, down-regulated, and that's never good for it to be to be, uh, to be be numb, to be uh, not be able to get the, the feedback in the loops that it needs. And then, you know, to kind of echo what you said, I don't like mild because this is, as Joe said, it's an end-stage disease of just of different levels. So those are great pearls. Love it. Couldn't agree more. And I love the, you know, stain without pain as a great way to remember it. So, you know, perfect timings. Corneal stain without pain is kind of the hallmark presentation. And Greg didn't know what the next slide was. That's just how impressive these guys are. Lack of conjunctival injection. Don't, not always, but it does tend to be a little disproportionate. And that might help you differentiate an infection where you have a really, really red eye versus a NK where you know, there's no, no, like in a case of maybe a microbial keratitis, we get that grade four injection, You're not going to get that with NK, but it's not usually going to be white all that often either. Uh, the non-healing epi defects, a good sign, sometimes corneal edema, if it's been there a while. So we talked about this briefly, but there's got to be some reason you would get NK. It doesn't suddenly show up, but there are many reasons. In fact, there's new research that shows chronic severe inflammatory conditions like a Sjogren's KCS, for example have a high incidence of NK. So there are even dry eye forms that eventually from chronic inflammation become neurotrophic, but the most common are going to be your herpetic diseases, zoster or shingles, simplex, uh, ocular. Uh, you're going to see a lot of cases where you have a uh, ocular yeah. surgery. Some I just had a patient who had cataract surgery, so she's doing fine until then. Um, missed the refractive error being hyperopic. So they did a LASIK, which is interesting, after a cataract surgery. Um, she was a highly myop myopic, became a little hyperopic, had a LASIK. Unfortunately, from her high myopia, developed an RD, had a buckle, 
and presented with a ulcer. There was just no nerve function, but it's usually those multiple surgeries that end up doing it. One is rare. There's something called LINK. It's called LASIK-induced neurotrophic keratitis. Estimates are like one in 10,000, eight to 10,000 cases. So very, very rare, but multiple surgeries can do it. I don't agree with contact lenses. I, I just don't see, an, yet to see an NK in my career. I mean, they get some hypoesthesia, and I think it's good to put that in there. I mean, you take a contact lens where, especially those who are RGPs, they can touch their eye, not really feel it. But that's not neurotrophic keratitis unless you get the staining or the epithelial defect. And I rarely see that or the ulcer, which you just don't see with con that group. So I would disagree with that one. I need to take that one out. Uh, chemical burns, of course. Patient who, you know, he's wondering the patient who steals your tetracaine because they're in a lot of discomfort. You know, what's the risk there? And I've actually seen a, a ER uh, patient come back from the ER with anesthetic for paracaine, I think it was. I don't know if they gave it to her or if she took it, but right. it happens. The big risk when they do that is they induce a neurotrophic keratitis. You shut down those nerves, they don't come back if you use it long enough. And uh, certainly drug toxicity, which can include your prostaglandin analogs, very pro-inflammatory. Any long-term inflammation can do that. And the BAK. And then uh, chronic ocular surface injury. You guys are top glaucoma people, very well recognized for many areas, retina, glaucoma, anterior segment, but I always lean on you guys a lot for glaucoma. Do you see, do you think there's much NK in patients with long-term glaucoma meds? I, I don't see it. Uh, you you can get a chronic and a bad dry eye from a lot of medications, both the preservers and the the active ingredients. Uh Timolol can cause a relative hypoesthesia. I guess that can give a little bit, but for the most part, I don't think that I have ever come across what I would say is medicate glaucoma medication induced NK. It may be coincident in somebody who has something else going on. In fact, I just saw one today that uh, was decompensating with uh, bullous keratopathy. Makes sense. You know, I think you're right, Joe. I think that is the right answer. I don't think in of itself, I can ever say that I've had a patient referred in for NK because of glaucoma medications. But you're right. I if think, they have diabetes I, and glaucoma yeah. and had a surgery and maybe those multiple things, it could be one additional. But I, I my experience is the same. But it was kind of cool this year at the OGS meeting, Paul, the Optometric Glaucoma Society meeting. They did address how it can create the, you know, the keratitis, maybe not the neurotrophic keratitis, but you know, we're taking at least, you know, uh, a look at that. Um, and I agree that I never seen one just from the drops, but from all maybe the co comorbidities. I like that. And you're right. You do have that whole ocular surface issue, VAK. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Systemic, you know, the big one that comes up is diabetes. Uh, you know, I have a probably, I'd say my second largest group of NK patients are those with diabetes. Number one would be herpetic disease. Uh, MS, um, I think that one patient actually I've had uh, MS with it. I've seen it oh, in other conditions like Parkinson's. They just don't blink enough. They become neurotrophic over time. Um, sometimes exposure keratitis that's extreme, like a Bell's palsy doesn't heal, can get a neurotrophic ulcer down there. So there are other conditions that come into play, but these are rare, uh, vitamin A, leprosy, amyloidosis. Uh, neurosurgeries at a, a patient who uh, was very... Uh, one of the more wealthy families in Indiana when I was helping a clinic in Carmel, Indiana, kind of get started. And uh, she and her husband and her three kids came. They looked like they were out of a model magazine, all of them. Um, and apparently were one of the big uh, families with, with a lot of money from the area. And she could go to anywhere, end up developing an acoustic neuron. And uh, so she did all the research. Where can I go? What should I do? Found a place in San Francisco, they said, where they've never had a... Um, you know, a trigeminal nerve injury. That was the issue sometimes because a large nerve gets in around the trigeminal nerve. So they researched all of this and this person said he had not. They went there and of course, never say never. That's what happened. So she presented with a ptosis and while the ptosis was an issue, uh, what was really the issue was the, her level of persistent corneal epithelial defect under it. She was sent over because I you know, do a lot of cornea and the question was, was the ptosis causing it? Well, no, they were both caused by you know, the cut of the trigeminal nerve and some of the nerves in that area when they were removing the tumor. And uh, and 
That was a great example of, of an NK induced by a acoustic neuroma removal. So those kind of surgeries can do it. And I've had a number of patients who've had strokes who develop NK. So since we're talking about pharmaceuticals, we had to at least introduce the disease state. Here's our, our pharmaceutical. So this new drug, not new, I guess, after three years, you can't even call it really new, but relatively, is a biologic category drug, which means it actually mimics, it uh, doesn't mimic. Sinigermin is structurally identical to our own or endogenous nerve growth factor. So it's going to pretty much, if you took sinigermin and you took human nerve growth factor and you put them together, they're exact. So it is just going to, you're putting in what's missing in the body, or in this case, into the eye. So it's a naturally occurring neurotrophin. It is human nerve growth factor that's been developed. They won a Nobel Prize for it. And they you put it in the eye. Now, the dosing is significant. It is uh, six times a day. But fortunately, it's only two months. Now, that's still a long time. Don't get me wrong. Six times a day for two months is a long time. But at least you know there's an end to it. It's not a drop you're going to be on, like some dry eye drops for the rest of your life or a glaucoma medication. So at least, you know, after two months, I can stop it. You know, this is interesting because every now and then companies will ask advisors like the three of us or others that might be on the call, you know, how setting up a study or something like that. If they had come to me and said, we we're going to set up a study where we're only going to let in patients who are at least stage two or three. That means the persistent epithelial defect for more than 14 days or an ulcer of the cornea. We're not going to take the, the staining stage one. That's the group I would have taken. And we're not taking those. And after two months of therapy, six times a day versus the vehicle, you only get success if you can completely heal the cornea. That means ulcers healed and filled in, epithelium is healed, and all the staining's gone. I would laugh. I'd say you have no chance. It's not going to happen. That seems impossible. It's a lot because I I worked with NK in my cornea fellowship back in the mid '90s, and all we did was slow it down. That was our goal. We're going to put some preservative-free artificial tears, as Joe said, to slow it down. Doesn't do much. Maybe in a mild case, that's about it. Plugs have been shown. Actually, there's a study showing plugs help, but it's not going to reverse it or stop it. We would, uh, you know, eventually we'd have to do a tarsorophy. Eventually we have to do a Gunnarsson flap where you actually suture the conch from one side to the other side. That was like a last desperate act to keep the eye from perforating, but we would watch it slowly progress. So to think that you could actually go to complete corneal he healing would seem odd to me, but they, they, people know more than I do because they did the study that way. And it turned out 72%, they must've known their drug actually could achieve that. That is, there is no more staining in that area where the ulcer or the persistent epithelial defect was. The most common adverse event is um, nerve pain. You're bringing back the nerves. You're, you're taking a patient who might have a little light sensitivity, very little, like exactly what Greg said, you know, stain without pain, or in this case, a persistent epithelial defect or ulcer without pain. Um, but I use it more for stage one, which is just the stain without pain. And you're... Uh, you're, you're actually making the nerves come back. So guess what they feel? They feel pain again or some sensation. Now in the clinical trial, it was only 16%. I will tell you in my clinical practice, and maybe I ask more questions, maybe they don't, patients wouldn't tell you. I think it's like 50 some percent that of my patients will say, my eye's aching after about a week of using this drop or two. And, you know, you, they say you're not supposed to tell a patient that's great news, it's working, but that is kind of what's happening it is working. And so I tell them ahead of time, you know, there's not uncommon for half the patients I see to feel like they get some aching or pain as the nerves come back. And then it's usually better by somewhere near about four, six to eight weeks, not across the board. I have some patients who have that same pain right till the last drops in the eye, but most will kind of decrease or cease after about six weeks. And then the last two weeks are back. To, I didn't feel too much of it. So it's good to let them know that. There is about 10% that get tearing. Remember the reflexes from the trigeminal nerve? One is the trophic supply. The other was tearing, lacrimation, and blink. There are about 10% had that. Some had some redness, but that's really about it. So what's really most fascinating is at the end of the study, 72% now have no staining. They were brought back for follow-ups up to a year. And at a year, 80% of the 72% with no staining still had no staining. They didn't use any drops. They didn't go on artificial tears. They didn't go on back on sinigermin at all. 
they simply were seen for follow-ups on nothing and 80% were still clear. So it's, it's a pretty neat drug. It's really changed the lives of a lot of NK patients. It's something you need to be aware of. The cost is only $96,000 a dose. Uh, I say that facetiously, that is a lot, but rare diseases get covered by insurance companies. Some drugs like dry eye glaucoma don't, uh, allergy drops don't get covered at all, but rare disease drugs do. And, and the company, so you can't like send your prescription to CVS or Walgreens. They're not going to take the time to go to the insurance companies and fill out the forms or go to the Rare Disease Foundation and get it covered. You have to go through the independent pharmacy, but all the drugs are doing that. You know, the new perfluorohexaloctane from, uh, you know, that came out for dry eye. You have to go through Blink RX. The new uh, Lodolaner, the drop for uh, Demodex blepharitis, you have to go through Blink RX. Uh, the 0.09% cyclosporin that came out a few years ago, you have to go through Phil RX. So these specialty pharmacies have become a necessity. Otherwise, the patient won't get it covered. Uh, so this is one of those ones where you have to fill out the connect to care form in order to get the drug. I would say almost 100% of the patients that I've put on this drug and I probably have treated about a hundred and some have paid $50 for the entire drug. And that's what they should expect. Oh, let's do a question. Well, while this is rolling in, I want to kind of echo a little bit about that uh, pain. I have some really cool video in my neurotrophic keratitis lecture. I played this video of these patients and they'll say in the same kind of sentence, my eye hurts, but yet it feels better. <laughs> that is a great comment. <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, because pain receptors, there's different types, right? The, the yeah. opioid lecture that I give, you know, there's C fibers and B fibers and large and small. And so you're, like you said, you're bringing some back to life, but yet their eye feels better because <laughs> you kind of calming down some of the things. So it's kind of neat. It's and the other part I want to talk about is how cool is this biologic? You know, I think what scares a lot of optometrists when they hear biologic is that you see a Humira commercial, you see a Dupixin commercial, and all of those go after the immune system because they're targeting and shutting something down. Even teprotumumab uh, the, the, for, uh, for thyroid eye disease does yeah. that. Oh, sorry. Yep. This yeah. is such a cool allopathic way of taking that DNA, RNA sequence, running it through E. coli, spitting out the molecule, twisting it up and making it human nerve growth factor. It's not tinkering with the immune system. So such a safe medication that pretty much every optometrist should, should feel comfortable prescribing it. I love it. Really well said. All right. So which of the following is not a likely cause of NK or neurotrophic keratitis? Is it stroke or a cerebral vascular accident? Is it diabetes? Is it corneal surgery or is it tight eyelids? And Greg, when you say every optometrist should be comfortable prescribing it from an efficacy and a safety, safety profile, you know, that, that's absolutely correct. What really people need to do is just become comfortable doing it and learning how to do it. The first one or two are, are a challenge, but the company is very good at working with you. And you, you know, you get a rep, and they will they'll walk you through it. It's not a it's not a fast process, but you, you know, you you just figure out who your rep is and reach out and have her or him uh, guide you and assist you. And they're very good about it. That's a great point. And uh, Joe's comment about not a fast process, and he also mentioned the amniotic membrane that's those two go together because you're not going to get the drug typically approved immediately could take two four six weeks in some cases they're putting an amnion on there cryo preserve for example where you can get some nerve effect maybe it doesn't completely maintain it but it does reverse some of it maybe you heal the persistent field defect uh, maybe you clear some of the staining buys you some time before the oxidate starts. It usually doesn't keep me from putting them on the, sorry, the snigerman, but it does, you know, help me to kind of get the eye closed that prevents infection uh, because of the time to get it approved. As he said, that's not a bad first step. And I think any uh, optometrist who can fit a contact lens can fit amniotic membrane. And that allows you to get that starting spot, get the effects you need. And then when this drug does get approved, 
uh, you can then start it in a better place. How and Greg, how do you how do you feel about as an inter intermediary step, not just an amniotic membrane, but autologous serum? I love it. I think that's got a lot of nerve growth factors. I bump up the concentration. I typically for a dry eye patient, I do twenty percent uh, autologous serum because the eye banks or the uh, national outfits, vital tears, whatever, they all want a percentage. Uh, I'll do forty percent for NK. Uh, and in some really severe ulcers, I could do even 50 or higher percent. For a persistent epithelial defect, for the staining, I do 40%. I, I feel like it really helps. I, I've seen cases where the patient's coming back because I haven't, you know, and again, I'm starting this right away while I'm waiting for the approval of Synidromin. And I've seen pretty significant improvement. I think those are, again, I put them all in the biologics category, amnion, serum tears or autologous serum, you know, synidromin, they all seem to work well. Cytokine extract drops um, help too. You know, if the person can't do a blood draw, you might be able to get um, those biologics as well. So they're, they're not in the biologic class as per FDA approval, but they, they are biologic components. Those are things that um, all seem to help because they all have nerve growth factor within them. And, and the I best think thing is... Oops, in the in, in the in the spirit of differing comfort levels and a how to approach to education, you know, just uh, you know, I think it, it's worth mentioning autologous serum. There are companies out there, and we're, we're not promoting anybody. I, I have no vested interest. Something like Vital Tears, you set up an uh, you set you set up a uh, an account. And they'll walk you through it, and you can you can order this uh, on your own, and that's how I do. there are companies out there. We we used to use Vital Tears, however, we have so used so much in our practice that uh, we actually hired a physician assistant, and we we do our own in house at this point. Right, and that will help you out with, with one of the comments I was going to make is. I don't have that luxury. You have a nice big practice. I've been down. It's a great practice. Um, you're still going to get a delay like in a vital tears. Um, because by the time they get the blood draw, get them sent, get get the drug blood draw, which can take about a week or two, and then they get it spun. Could be two weeks. But the good news is we're going to use it on the tail end anyway. They're going to have it. So I usually treat a lot of that at the end. And then the other comment that I wanted to make, Paul, you rattled off all that stuff, which was awesome. And you talked about autologous blood serum. You talked about um, the uh, the amniotic membrane, the biologics, the Oxervate. And the, one of the biggest things I want to point out is that, you know, we're so used to being allopathic docs. You got a sty, we use an antibiotic. You got an iritis, you use a steroid, opposites cure. Everything you said in that statement, nothing was opposites. Everything was natural. It was amniotic membrane from a placenta. Amni uh, autologous blood serum from the blood, Oxervate, yeah, human growth factor. It's all kind of cool how we're treating this in kind of in a naturopathic way, and we don't even realize we're doing it. A great point. Well, there, there's a quick question: Are there contraindications using autologous serum in patients with HIV whose levels are undetectable? Um, well, you know, they're they're getting their own blood drawn. So they're going to be applying it to their own eyes, of course. Um, if it's undetectable, they're fine. But these labs like Vital Tears or others do, do have a system that tests for any of those components. Um, HSV, HIV, hepatitis. Um, I think there's like five or six. And if they come up positive, that is detectable, they won't actually distribute it. Um, so it's a little bit of a risk, but if it's not detectable in blood, it won't probably be detectable in serum, in which case the patient would be fine. I've never, you know, I don't know why it'd be really an issue too much, to be frankly, if it's such a small amount, the patient is putting it in their own eyes, but most of these high quality labs do rule things out and by their systems won't provide it if any of those components are found. They even test that stuff for test for those things in amniotic membranes too. FYI, that's right. That's right. Exactly. Um, I have another hand up. Do I? How does that work? Does I mean, it, 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 rather than put put a, putting your hand up, please just put it in the chat so we can okay. we can address it that way. 
Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. All right. Um, so the question, 87% of you got it. Now it's not, it wasn't as easy as you'd think. Like I put tight eyelids as an answer because I have seen patients who develop the opposite neuropathic corneal pain or corneal neuralgia where they are hyper aesthetic, like the airflow in a mall, it makes their eyes so debilitated they can't function. And I found there's a percentage of those who have really tight eyelids, like I can't flip the lid. And I wonder, was that just scraping up and down on the nerves for so long that they had the opposite effect? So strokes, diabetes, and corneal surgeries all can lead to neurotrophic keratitis, tight lids. Probably if it did do anything, it would lead to the opposite. Good job. All right, let's try another new drug, but starting with the case. I think it helps us to identify. 62-year-old gentleman complaining of itchy eyes with grittiness. You know, I always used to think itchy eyes meant allergies way back when. That was kind of what we always thought about. And this doc had seen some ophthalmologists, a cornea specialist, and others, and was treated with allergy medication. So I'm not going to fault them. I That was kind of my thinking years ago, too. If I patient had itching is probably allergies. I've learned over the years that when they have itching, the most important question is, where does it itch? You know, and if they say the canthal corner, then yep, yeah, that's in all likelihood of seasonal allergies or perennial allergies, some sort of allergic eye disease. That's really your key. But most of these patients like this gentleman were very clear of pointing out it was right at the lid margin. Like they even made the motion across the eyelids. And I've come to realize that demodex and other blepharitis forms can often do that. And that's why these drops this patient have been on haven't done a lot. And lid scrubs, you know, while we thought they could help, they do well for bacteria. They actually contribute in the sense of helping by removing bad oils, which demodex does like to feed off of. So doing a lid scrub like a surfactant scrub doesn't hurt, um, but they're not going to directly address the uh the actual pathogen of Demodex. In fact, Alan Cabot did a great poster many years ago where he took Demodex mites off of a, a lash, put some on a slide with oil. And of course, those Demodex mites were still swimming around it the next day. He put some of the mites, six to eight of them, in uh, like these cleaners. I think he used hypochlorous acid, uh, which again is more bacterial. And then he used tea tree. And of course, tea tree does burn and sting, but tea tree wiped them out <laughs> within three hours. The oil, the control group were still swimming around. Those demodex were moving around. They're migrating just fine the next day. And the hypochlorous acid at 12 hours, they were still doing the backstroke. So it shows that <clears throat> while there's no downside to using them and getting rid of bacteria, that does help. Getting rid of bad oils helps. They don't actually do anything to the mite itself. And so lid scrubs, allergy meds probably wouldn't help seeing a number of doctors. Had the patient look down, of course, I'm giving you the most extreme example. And as you might guess, what are these, what's the terminology for this debris at the base of the lashes or these sleeves or whatever you want to call them? I think for the most part, they've been now called collarettes. But anytime you see that at the base, that's the extrusion products of the demodex mites. You know, each follicle might have 9, 10, 12 in there if it looks this bad. And, and Greg, Greg, Greg has a technical term that he has coined for this. Greg, what is that? <laughs> yeah, that's Demodex poop on the eyelashes right there. So, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I like your Paul, it, terminology. It's as direct as it gets. Yeah. And with that right. said, Paul, you know, I think it is a, is an allergy. It's just a type four allergy. You know, you know you've got a chronic exposure to literally, uh, you know, Demodex poop. It's sitting there and I think they get an allergy because they're inflamed. I just don't think it's a, you know, type one. I think it's more type four allergy. So I think that's brilliant, Craig. I mean, because they do complain of itching, you know, they're very specific about where it is, but the itching often does get associated with allergy. They're probably not itching just from all the poop. They're itching from the reaction to it. So that is a great insight. Um, totally makes sense. Location still important. So while it's not seasonal type one, it is type four. Um, that really fits with the symptomatology because most of the symptoms are itching followed by grittiness then eventually things like dry eye and other things where they're trying to lose. And a lot of people who have Demodex obviously are going to have MGD, meibomian gland dysfunction. The, the follicularum form of Demodex really loves the lash follicles. There's a lot of meibom and stuff in there, but the brevis, the much smaller form, which typically they're together, 
prefers the meibomian glands. And so hence you do get some comorbid dry eye many times, or at least meibomian gland dysfunction if it doesn't tip into true immune mediated dry eye. So those other symptoms might be more based on the brevis form that come into play. So it's a pretty big crew. I mean, if you look at the research, the Triton study that came out showed that 57% uh, of all patients who present to an optometrist have some cholerets. Now, there may be only two, which may not be clinical, um, but in more than half the people, and that was all comers. It was contact lens wearers, people coming in for the glasses, refraction, cataract, surgery evaluation, glaucoma, dry eye. All of it were included. They didn't exclude any patients in this big study. And the number that saw some colorettes, again, they're looking closely at the lashes as you look down, was 57% of all comers, which comes out to about 20 million people, um, probably if you look at the whole population. But we know in, in epidemiological studies that at least 9 million have known positive diagnosed for Demodex. I do think it's highly underdiagnosed. You see misdirected lashes, MGD is there, but it's believed that the number one reason for contact lens dropout in one or a few particular papers actually pointed to blepharitis and more particularly Demodex. There was a high correlation there uh, between the two. So we talked a bit about the two forms, the follicularum in the lashes, that's magnified well there. The brevis gets in the meibomian glands. 45% uh, of blepharitis cases have been shown uh, over historically to be from uh, Demodex. It's one of the grossest videos you'll ever see. Demodex mites are the most common ectoparasites found on humans. While they are highly prevalent in low numbers, an infestation of mites can lead to blepharitis and meibomian gland disease. There are two species of Demodex, folliculorum and brevis, that live on the skin of the face and eyelids. Demodex folliculorum inhabits the eyelash follicles where they scrape the epithelial cell lining with their claws and excrete digestive enzymes to feed on the oily sebum deep in the follicle, causing inflammation, hyperemia, and irritation. Both species of mites can carry bacteria on their surface or in their gut, causing inflammation of the surrounding tissue. Demodex brevis prefers the rich mybum in the meibomian glands on the posterior lid margin. As the mites thrive in this nutrient-rich environment, they begin to proliferate, causing disease by mechanical, chemical, and bacterial mechanisms. This leads to more tissue damage and blockage of the glands and follicles, leading to further inflammation. The overgrowth of the mites in the follicle leads to follicular distension, misdirected lashes, matarosis, and irritation. As mites proliferate, the partially digested epithelial cells, keratin, mite waste, and eggs combine to form collarettes, which can be seen with a slit lamp. These collarettes are a pathognomonic sign of Demodex infestation and are specific for Demodex blepharitis. Patients also experience other symptoms of blepharitis, including redness, lid itching, and eye irritation. So hopefully you're not eating while we go through these, but they are your dinner. But here's good, you know, the key is you got to look down. There, there's really, it's amazing how you would miss many of these cases. Like, let me run this video here. I'm looking at this patient straight on. Well, I see a little bit of missing lashes. That should be an indication something's not right. But I, until she looks down, I can't see those little sleeves at the base of the lashes. When I magnify a little, I could see them a lot better. This is a more typical appearance than that extreme case I showed you. Uh, those extreme cases are probably less than two or three percent. This is probably the, the bulk of cases that you're going to see. Patients have been treated with cyclosporin and lepidograst and everything else that sounded like dry eye or allergy or not getting better. And then you just have the patient look down. You're like, aha, I know what's going on. These are cholerets and this is Demodex blepharitis. So straight on, hard to see them. Looking down, no problem at all. So number of symptoms that come into play. Uh, that you would expect. We've already kind of covered most of them. So our newest drug to come out for this is called Lodolaner. <clears throat> uh, Lodolaner is a, uh, my block out is not working there. Lodolaner is a drug that is actually been veterinary medicine based first, like cyclosporin. Our first cyclosporins were actually used in veterinary medicine, then became human treatments. This is another one of those examples. In fact, dogs who have Demodex infestation, the term is mange. You know, a mangy dog is just a Demodex dog. 
you don't see mange hardly anymore. And that's because they take a pill um, in these frontline products and the pill is just lotolanin. And that's what's in this product here, lotolanin. But this of course is for human use. It's concentration 0.25%. And so that very small concentration um, allows it to utilize well on the eye. Um, and it's got, I think, sorbic acid for its preservative, not BAK. And then you're using this twice a day. The big advantage here is this is absolute eradication, paralysis and death of the Demodex mite upon contact. It uh, it really has, I'll show you some of the eradication rates. They're pretty crazy, but it works on the GABA inhibition system to completely paralyze the mite and uh, and is truly going to wipe them out completely. In fact, eradication occurs within 20 hours. So you're looking at, you know, within a day, complete eradication of the mites. Now, people say, well, why is this drop prescribed six weeks? And that's it. You don't use this one long term either. Our first two drugs we covered are cure drugs, meaning doesn't mean I don't should say cure because it might come back. But it probably it won't come back for a long time. Like NK, 80% of people were still clear a year later. In the Demodex clinical trial um, for Lodolaner, uh, about 70% of patients still had no signs of mites or cholerets, I should say, at a year. So even though they only used it for six weeks. And in the trial, I guess they wanted to really show separation from the vehicle. They weren't allowed to touch the ride. They had to put the drop in. They couldn't do lid scrubs. They couldn't move it in. Like when I tell patients to use low lantern today, I say, put it in your eye and the excess drop, I do want it in the eye because I want it clearing out the meibomian glands for, from brevis. I want it getting in there. Uh, but I do want the excess. I mean, 40, 50 microliter drop is a lot of excess to just kind of gently put it at the base of the lashes where the likely hypersensitivity reaction, as Greg described, is. And I think if you do that, you're going to have even better results than the clinical trial, faster results, and probably longer duration of effect. So the question is, why six weeks? Here's day one. Look at day 28, completely clear. In fact, most patients, when you have them rub the excess into the base of the lashes gently, will say, my eyes are completely clear at two weeks, and you look at them at the slit lamp, and you can't even find a single colorette. So why are we saying use it for six weeks when this eye is completely clear in the study at day 28, probably completely clear at day 14? Well, in order to get the cure rates that you're seeing there, 96% uh, high rates, eradication rates, really extremely high, you have to kill the, the mites, which is they have an 18-day life cycle. And they're adults for about five to six days. That's when they do all their damage during that time. That's when they try to procreate. That's when they get in and eat a lot, do all the stuff. That's when they're making kind of big messes in the lashes and the glands. And all that poop, as uh, Greg described, comes out of there. Well, guess what happens? There's another 18-day cycle of what? The eggs and the nits. So I learned this the wrong way. I, this is what I did wrong. I was using IPL for Demodex treatment with a blue low-level light therapy mask. Loved it. Patients would be like clear. Oftentimes I'd do a blepharo exfoliation to get rid of any of the, the mites, colorets, to debulk it. And I'd put them on a Manuka honey cleaner that I, I think works phenomenally well. And I'd see these great results and I'd say, wow, you are clear. You're two weeks into it. And I did two IPL treatments with the blue mask. And then it all come back. And I'd be like, how is this coming back so quick? So we do it again. Again, this is all out of pocket pay. So the patients are right thinking, gosh, I got to do this again. What I was doing wrong is I was doing all the treatments within the first 18 days. And yeah, they look great because I killed all the adults. And all the eggs were hatching and coming back. If I had been smart, and I learned this from this drug, I would have, all I had to do was do a third treatment after day 18, somewhere around three weeks or four weeks in. And I would have killed all the eggs. And now we would get this longevity of effect. But I didn't know that. Looking at this research on this new drug, Lotolaner, I clearly see that because you go the full six weeks, you get that year effect. And that's what um, the studies show. And look at the separation from the vehicle in terms of patients with two or less cholerets at the end. 
Uh, again, it's about 50% met their primary eye point, but that's because they couldn't touch their eye. I couldn't do the things we tell them to do now. So for balance, you could do IPLs and LLLTs. Maybe you should be doing a second, a third treatment after 18 days. Patients with rosacea often have cholerets. Not uncommon to see the two together. IPLs have been shown to work for Demodex, especially with the blue mask on LLLT treatments. And here's some good data that was produced in a paper by Stonecipher that showed a um, you know significant improvement in everything, OSDI, breakup time, and even meibomian gland scores. You can also debulk biofilm. You could debulk the cholerets. There's nothing wrong with doing some of these microblepharic exfoliation procedures to get rid of things that are there, but none of these will completely eradicate the mite like the lodal enter um, that comes into play that we described. Now here's a patient, you can tell I they have a lot of demodex a lot of colorettes, even though they don't have any lashes. And many and patients who are missing lashes or have thin lashes almost always have demodex blepharitis. And then after the microblepharic exfoliation, I have now, as I lift up the eyelid, don't see any colorettes. But those eggs will come back. And that's why having a drop that lasts six weeks is key. Again, to be balanced, there are products that have coconut oil in it that have actually been shown to statistically prevent uh, Demodex from uh, being present to keep them from grabbing onto the lashes. Um, there's a clinic, there's actually been shown Manuka honey to be one of the most effective treatments. In fact, more effective and more comfortable than tea tree oil and, and widely used in places like Australia and Asia. They don't use tea tree very often. They've all moved over to Manuka. It's not the honey, it's the leaf, the leaf and they take the extract from there. So it's not sticky. It's just Manuka honey tree. Um, and then you've got uh, things like uh, aloe that also have been shown to help. So there's a product that has all three of these in it. I would use that today after the Lodal Lantern so that it never comes back um, to be in place. Yeah, so any comments from Joe Gregg on the new Lodal Lantern? What's your experience been with this drop twice a day for six weeks? Greg, go ahead. Yeah, I'm probably about, uh, I'm about uh, eight. Rx is into it, got them all kind of video documented. And it is, Paul, you nailed it. Two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, they all look clear. But, you know, you're going to want to stop that medication. And you said it beautifully. If you want to eradicate it, you got to get those eggs and go out that six weeks. I just tell them twice a day. Um, you know, I tell them to the bottle's empty. And, you know, you another thing that you hit well on, but I want to echo is, you know, most drops, you know, that go to the eye, and that's when the nano dropper came out is, you know, the eye can really only hold whatever it is, eight, 10, 11 microliters. Mm -hmm. And most drops are 30 to 50. So you're going to run out, take that and smear it on there and get those buggers all taken care of that are there. And uh, the last comment I'll make is that this GABA, whatever it is, calcium channel blocker is only found in the mite. So it's not in the human. So it's super, super safe. And that's why it has a great safety profile. Well, that's a great insight. Didn't know that. I love it. You know, Paul, like being in Florida, we have a formulary. So when something is FDA approved, it's still a, a long time before we get uh, use of yeah. it. So yeah. my experience is, relative, is relatively limited. But a couple of things I want, I want to share as a pearl with, you know, with the audience if you're picking away or cleaning away the cholerets, you're not really getting the, the organism. I mean, that's just their waste products. You're making it look prettier, but the organisms are are still there. That's why you need to uh, to be more, more invasive. Now, don't go looking for the mites. They're too small. In order to really see them, you've got to tweeze out a lash and look under a true microscope, not a bio microscope, but a true microscope. And that's not practical. Personally, for all, all that I've seen recently in all the research, I'm satisfied that when I see cholerets, I know what I'm looking for. I don't need the tweeze. I don't need the microscope. I'm satisfied with that. And if you can actually see an organism, you're not dealing with demodex. You're looking at something uh, much more uh, more sexually transmitted, such as psoriasis. That's great insight. You know, I'm 100% agreement. I mean, I don't think you need the tweeze. You don't need the microscope. You don't need 
anything. You need a slit lamp, which we all have, and a patient to look down. I, I think that we sometimes make it a little trickier than we need to. That is really an ideal thing. The other little pearl I'd add in is that, you know, this drug typically uh, will get approved, um, Medicare a little tougher, but commercial insurance for between 20 and $50 for about 80% of patients. Part of that's the company trying to create demand for the product. Uh, so it's a good time to prescribe. In fact, I tell patients the best time to prescribe a new, medica a new medication because it's least costly is at the beginning. Because when they first come out, they're going to be the least costly ever because then eventually the insurance company is going to negotiate something and then that's going to be the set price now there is of course the government insurance government won't pay for new drugs for a year now um, and they yes. won't let people participate in free drug plans like the perfluorohexaloctane the new meibomian gland evaporative dry eye drug that got approved around the same time is free i mean you know, it's weird it's a game you go through blink rx and the patient gets a text saying your drug will cost $714.12 or $214.12 more commonly. And we have a coupon for $214.12. Kind of ironic, but that's what the text says. And it's it's $0 for almost everyone, except Medicare. You can't participate in free drug plans and you can't get it covered. So sometimes the other supplemental <laughs> will, but the patients that are there, but you have to have the right code. You have to have blepharitis code is your ICD-10, which is H01.0. And besides that one, you also have to have a Demodex code. And the Demodex code really means other acariasis and, uh, or Demodex specifically. And that's a B as in Bravo, 88.0. Um, so those both have to be listed now for those insurance companies to give you the, give patients the $20 or $50 load lanner. But that's a pretty good deal because it's you're done after six weeks. That the bottle's finished, you're there. So it is a uh, an ideal option. I have a couple questions, Paul. Um, yes. Tessa asks, is, do commercial pharmacies carry this? Great question. I'm so glad someone asked that. The answer is no. Um, well, I should take that back. CVS has a specialty pharmacy. Um, Walgreens has a specialty pharmacy alliance something. So if you use the specialty pharmacy within some of these um, outfits, it can still go through. They they will actually do the work. But if you just run it through your typical CVS, Walgreens, Kroger, no, no, they 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 won't do the work. They'll they'll state they're understaffed. We don't do that. It's not covered. Um, end of story. So you're best to go through the recommended independent pharmacies that are listed for the company that have already been detailed. And for Lodolander, it is Blink RX is the most used, but it's been almost overwhelmed because the perfluorohexaloctane that just came out also uses Blink RX. And now it's taking a little longer to get it because both drugs are going through there. So your CVS specialty pharmacy will maybe even quicker sometimes, same with the Walgreen ones, but you have to get the form from the rep to know specifically the number to, to or your EHR, exactly which pharmacy to send it to because the standard Walgreen CVS Kroger's won't go through. Well, Keith makes a comment and I can, I can, I can formulate this into a question. He says most, if not all patients are yeah, asymptomatic. I can put more of these on there. Got it. Uh, are asymptomatic yet demonstrate demodex on microscopy? That you know, I, I agree with that. So let me form formulate that into a question from a statement. Do you do something about it? If you see the significant cholerates in a person who's asymptomatic, how do you handle that, Paul? That is actually a terrific question because it happens way more often. I can I look at some patients and I'm like, how are you not feeling that? I, I mean, I feel it looking at your eyelids under the slit lamp, you know, and then they're like, I, I didn't notice. I felt you know a little irritated or dry. I didn't think anything of it because it's so gradual as it develops. But yeah, I think I'm starting to realize that the most common reason for a hordeola or a chalazion is probably Demodex. I used to think it was bacterial. I just see in way too many lately on patients who have cholerets. So they, they have so many things that likely can develop. I'm you know, I tell patients, you may not be feeling much of this now, but eventually you're going to notice your lashes will get thin, they'll fall out, contact lens wear becomes very difficult, 
You may get to immune mediated dry eye or chronic dry eye if we let this go because these these mites get into the meibomian glands. But now I see patients who have like hardly any glands left when I do myography. They're either Accutane high dose prescribed when they were young, um, or there's severe rosacea or demodex. And usually rosacea demodex go together. So I got to figure they didn't that demodex didn't all of a sudden within a few weeks kill all those glands. It probably did it over a decade or more. So even though they're asymptomatic, I don't want to let them lose their lashes, their meibomian glands, their ability to wear a contact lens, all that stuff. If I could prescribe something that's relatively inexpensive right now that works in six weeks, that's only twice a day, that's very comfortable, as Greg said, I'm going to go ahead and make the recommendation. If it wasn't progressive, if there wasn't risk of all these things happening and they're asymptomatic, I'll leave it. Now, if I'm seeing handful, few cholerats in an asymptomatic patient, I'll probably just use a lid scrub. You know, I mean, there is a point where there is a cutoff. Now, if there's only a few cholerats and they're highly symptomatic, yeah, I'll prescribe it. Or there's a lot of cholerats and they're asymptomatic, I'll prescribe it, but not if they're asymptomatic with very few. Yeah, one of the other things that, that I would add to that is, you know, the anterior segment camera has become one of my easiest ways of showing people what's going on and just showing them, you know, I usually tell them they have, this is what's creating the, them to have their shitty outlook on life because of the poop thing, but, uh, and we <laughs> laugh about it and so on and so forth. But once I show it to them, um, I basically let them decide, do they want to eradicate it if they're asymptomatic? But I do tell them what you just said. This could lead to the chalazian, the the styes, the, the lash loss. And why wait? But it's up to you since you don't have symptoms. But show them the picture. I love pictures worth a thousand words. I don't hear the adage all the time, but you're so right. If When I show them, and I usually magnify the picture a little more. It seems to scare them even more. You know, uh, they, I'm always fascinated by it. They look at it and they're like, wow, that's on my eyelids. I said, yeah, that's something we got to get rid of because here's what's going to happen if we don't treat it. And, and it's also nice to have a, a link to a, a Google image of the mite up close. They don't really like looking at them up close. Great point. Right. And in the few of the people I've done that for, they didn't realize that they had symptoms when they were done. They were like, I didn't realize that my eyes felt bad, but they feel better. So a great, great point. Can't tell you how many times I've seen the same thing, Greg, where the patient came back and said, you know, so glad we did this. I didn't realize my eyes feel so much cleaner and better and all those things. It's such a fact. I think they just adapted to it until yeah. they get to a point where it's so bad they can't adapt. And I don't want them to wait till that. At least I wouldn't want to if it was my eyes. New drug coming out within the next two years is something called a keratolytic. Now, keratin builds up on my bombing glands fairly regularly for many things. It's just a quick debridement. It's actually one of my first debridements I ever did. I'm not very good at it here. It just shows you, though, that even when you get started, it's not a hard thing to do. You, you just kind of run it over the orifices. I take about five seconds now to do this. But patients will tell you, I don't do it this much, that it feels better on their eyes than anything you do. I had a patient that literally lived 45 minutes away. Uh, she looked great. There was I, not that kind of keratin. There's a lot on there. But she looked great. Her my bone glands were working wonderful. I said, congratulations. You're doing fantastic. This might have been a few years ago. Um, and let her go. And I get a call back. Uh, Carla's my lead technician says, Dr. Vega, that patient you saw earlier uh, said you forgot to do that thing to her eyelids. I'm like, that thing to her eyes. I'm like, oh, debridement. And you don't need anesthetic because it feels so good. It's like itching a place on your back. People will tackle you if you don't do this, if you're working in dry eye, uh, if you forget to do it. Anyway, she, I said, well, I guess she can come back and I'll do it. And she said, well, she lives 45 minutes away. She drove 45 minutes back. And this time, instead of five seconds, I took like 25 seconds. I'm like, I'm going to get everything there really well. And she drove home. So that means an hour and a half for the first exam or, or an hour, 40, yeah, an hour and a half. Wow. First exam. And then an hour, she drove three hours for me to do that. That's the impact it has on patients. So they're working on a drug. It's in phase three trials. So about two years from approval. It's a drop. It's actually an ointment. You put it on the lower eyelid twice a week and it debrides all of that keratin. 
that is the real significant contributor to my bone and gland dysfunction and evaporative dry eye. Uh, it's very similar to what they do in dermatology. Actually, this is a dermatological agent that's been shown to remove keratin. Um, just in this case, it's made for the eye. Uh, instead, it's keratolytic, keratostatic, and lipogenesis. It actually produces oils. In fact, to such a high level that the oils increased by 348%. Hmm. And uh, in their first, in their second trial, 282% in the first trial, pretty amazing data, very comparable, both statistical between the two. So that's one to watch for. But more recently, we've had another approval per fluorohexyl octane. It's a very unique drop. It's the smallest drop we have available to date. It's only 11 microliter drop instead of 30 to 50. Like the reason why the, the um, uh, loader lanner for Demodex is so nice is because it's 40 to 50 microliters. You're going to get a lot of excess drop to kind of rub into the lashes. This is the opposite extreme. It's trying to mimic the meibomian layer, and it is only 11 microliters. And it's the most comfortable drop. Like, there's no blink reflex. So the big the big negative, if, if you can call this a negative, for, for fluorohexyl octane, um, it's actually a Padufa June, but it's approved. Um, you know, it's been, it's, it got its approval in June, and it became available. It's the fastest uptake of any drug in eye care history. In, uh, in its first two and a half months, not even, or two months, there were over 70,000 prescriptions gone through for this drop. If there is a knock, you can't tell it's going in your eye. Maybe you put it in the fridge. I don't know if that'll help. But I like when I use it, I notice a little blur for a few moments. Then I have the clearest vision for the rest of the day. Otherwise, I can't tell it's in there. Maybe I feel a little oil in the corner. Maybe I feel that. But I can't, um, I don't feel it hitting the eye at all. It's very there's, fast. There's, there's no pH to it. I mean, there's no pH, so it doesn't burn. Right? I mean, that's it. No pH. No, no water. water. So you don't need a preservative. 100% perfluorohexyl octane. Um, I said 11 microliters, 12. I was close. Um, you're right, Greg. No pH. Can't feel it. Seems weird to have a drop with no pH, but it's a single agent drop. Uh, duration for an average uh, for any product that's water based, which is all of them. Um, is about three to five minutes. That's about all you can expect the drop to stay on the eye. Some of the newer ones get up to five minutes, like your your new, newer um, loader prednol 0.38s, for example, or 0.2s with you know that are approved for dry eye. Stick around about five minutes. This drug is four to six hours. And what's really fascinating in the clinical trials is they. It showed that the prevention of evaporation with perfluorohexyl octane is four times better than healthy human mybum. Now, the mybum was, you know, 50-year-old patient. They took an average patient, 48, 40, 50, something like that, that had healthy, non-dry eye, perfect flowing mybum, and they used that as the comparator, and it evaporated four times faster than this drop as far as the, the fluid underneath the tears. So it's a pretty fascinating drop. Uh, very fast acting. Most of the data at two weeks was hitting its outcome in every single trial. Two times the improvement um, to that of a, and the vehicle was a uh, hypotonic solution that the FDA required. Hypotonic saline, which is in a lot of artificial tears, not balanced saline, not hypertonic saline, but hypotonic. That's the, FDA, the phase two was hypertonic. And the FDA said, well, that's not fair. You're going to have to do something that's in an artificial tear. So they went uh, to a different form because there's no vehicle in this drug. 1.5 times the improvement in eye dryness scores, including at day 15. Almost, this is how comfortable the drop was. There were no adverse events. One person out of 641 discontinued the trial. Um, she had some mild symptoms. Uh, three out of 614 had burning, three out of 614. And 13 out of 614 had the blurred vision. And I'm one of those. I get blurred vision for, uh, my, I don't know if mine would count. It's probably about a minute of blur. And then I get super clear. And that's kind of what the, there were no complaints. And I think Greg said the reason why there's no pH, there's no preservative, there's nothing but the drop itself that's in there. And it's just hard to know, but it mimics your tear function, except that it lasts for about six hours. It's also found to reside in the meibomian glands for over 24 hours. So it's continually pumping back in there. 
it's a semi-fluorinated alkane. So what that means is the fluorines love air. So when you put it on the eye, it's like they reach for the sky and the alkanes reach into the oil and they need oil to anchor. And in fact, this is so important because this tells you who to choose your droplet. The only people that I've not seen this work on are patients who have the no meibomian gland function. You express them, nothing comes out. They have a lipid layer that's 20 microns instead of, or 20 nanometers instead of being, you know, the 100, 120 it should be. Now you're thinking, well, isn't that what this is for? It's for, it's called mybo. I mean, the I and the E are spelled backwards for mybo, but still it's for meibomian gland. Well, alkanes need to anchor in some oil. So you got to have some. Now you don't have perfect oil because you may not need it. But no oil won't work. It'll feel tacky. Now, that being said, it's going to work for 95%, 98% of your dry eye patients. But the ones who had no glands, who are the Accutane poor patients early on, often don't have enough oil for this to work. But everyone else does. And it is four times more effective in inhibiting evaporation than healthy human mybo. All right. Any experience? Uh, Greg, have you had much experience with this one? I know Florida wouldn't have this one either because it's still very, very new. Yeah, I have. Um, you know, it's one of those that, you know, the patients, you know, it's, it's a love-hate with it. Uh, most of them love it. Um, the, the hate is that they can't really feel it going in. They're having a tough time, but uh, they are getting the benefits uh, that are out there that that's unique with this drop. Um, you know, drawback is you have to prescribe it. You have to go through the prior authorization process, but you know, like you said, and when they're launching it, you know, the first one is generally free or zero or minimal payment with that, you know, commercial and even, you know, a little bit of hoop jumping with that Medicare patient. But uh, I've been very pleased. I've seen corneas heal um, with it. So that's nice. Um, I guess what I'm just trying to figure out, and I can ask you, Paul, is that, you know, you, you considering this a chronic medication or kind of a short term, um, you know, you, they do heal these corneas. Do we have to keep them on it? And if we got the other treatments going. So what's your thoughts on that? I love that question because I just had a discussion with another doc on this who said that they've used this to replace steroids, meaning I've been using this instead to get my effect, keep them on the other drugs, and then I use it when they have a flare-up. And I'm thinking that's just the opposite of my thinking, but it's good to hear many opinions because we don't know yet. I see this more as the any patient who has MGD, this is a better monolayer than what they have. Now, you still got to treat the meibomian gland dysfunction because it just covers it and creates this better barrier than, um, than you could normally have. So you still want to still do, for me, it's great because I'm still going to do like an IPL or some other treatment to get their oils to a point where this is even better. Now, there's not that many patients this wouldn't work on. They'd have to have like zero expression. Uh, which is not too many, but it forces me to do some treatments because those are patients I see that then I get this drop and I get good success with it. Um, I like it as an everyday kind of drop. I don't think you need it four times a day unless you have significant evaporative dry eye. I think most patients will be, you know, it lasts six hours. That's BID. Uh, so that seems to be common. I have a lot of three times a day patients and two, and I've been able to get really good success with success with that a long term. Now, it doesn't treat inflammation, so it doesn't mean I take them off their uh, their um their lefitograst or their cyclosporin. I might keep those for a while, but eventually you never know. I mean, this could actually be the replacement. So, I'm currently using it as my my base because I think that, you know, for years all we ever did was treat the downstream inflammation. That's what cyclosporin did, steroid short term that are approved for dry eye, lefitograst was always treating the inflammation. We never went after why you're getting the inflammation. It's kind of like the old, you know, was it, uh, there's a famous old, I think it was Confucius, but one of the things, or it was Gandhi who talked about, you know, we're pulling all these bodies up and saving them at the bottom of the river. Someone needs to go to the top of the river and see who's throwing them in the water. You know, we're treating the inflammation. You know, someone has to go up there and realize why we're getting inflammation. And I think MGD, Demodex blepharitis, inadequate lid seal. Those are some of the three most common causes for chronic inflammation related to dry eye. We're finally addressing all three. There's those sleep type products for the incomplete adequate lid seal that work phenomenally well. There's this new perfluorohexaloctane for the MGD. 
And we've got lotolanner for the blepharitis. So we're finally going upstream and figuring out who's throwing the people in the river. And now we may not have to do as much inflammation treatment downstream at one point. Oh, I think that, that, was, that was, go ahead, Joe. A question came in. Do you think this will help if you administer it before a refraction, if there is a dry eye tear breakup issue? Yes, yes. I, I feel like, like I'm a good example. I've had dry eye for a long time. I have inadequate lid seal in both eyes, but I've had like recurrent erosion. I think I ended up in this field only because I wanted to fix myself originally. I really had, <laughs> so I've always had these issues. Recurrent erosion was back when I was in my 20s and did optometry school. I was really the person everybody looked at to see um, what RCE looked like. And, um, but anyways, my I figured out later why, and I'm at a good stage where it's at. My refraction improves dramatically after this drop. So for me, it gives me a, a very ad accurate refraction. Now, of course, if I don't use it, then my refraction does change, but that's the level of, of dry eye I have. Um, but so the answer, and again, it's not an end of one. I've seen it in other patients too, besides myself. It, it becomes a real good way to gain an accurate refraction in a patient. Um, my quality vision went on the eye trace, which you measure a kind of quality of tears, went from a 5.4 to a 9.8 when I put one of these drops in. Uh, that's really more of a measure of visual quality than it is of dry, dry it is dry eye cost, but, but it's more of a visual quality measurement. So, Paul, this I asked this question to my uh, MSL, and you probably had similar questions. And and there was a question that rolled in here. It says, "Is there any concern? Is this being a forever chemical? As we know that the perfluoral hexyl octanes are you know, kind of like fire retardants and so on and so forth. It's also used in retinal detachment surgery. It's one of the gases that they use to tampen on the retina down. But when I asked the MSL, the medical science liaison for those out there that you know, that don't know what that acronym is. Um, he gave a really good explanation, but yeah, you know, all I got out of it, okay, it's safe and it's different. Do you remember the the bigger talk or have you had that discussion? You know, I embarrassingly, I had dinner with the RMSL last night here. Um, <laughs> had this wonderful opportunity to ask him any question I wanted to. And I never thought about that one. Um, would have been a really good one to ask. What I recall was, the uh of course the the 12 microliters does help it's such a small amount but i also think it had to do with something along the way that this one is designed um but i'm going to try and text him real quickly and if i can get an answer in the next um what do we have 15 18 more minutes then i'll start this yeah and go ahead, Paul. And I know I have, I just walked across. I think I wrote it down somewhere. So go ahead and I'll see if I can find it too. I, I wrote the answer down, but. Yes, I had it here tomorrow. I remember them telling me, and isn't that funny? You and I have the same on that. I can't recall the exact answer, but it gave me hope to think that, yeah, that's probably going to be perfectly fine um, in terms of, of, you know, how it works from that standpoint. But let me go ahead and I'll just finish my text. And if something comes back in time, we'll go with that. And if not, we'll um, we'll be good. So, all right. We got another one that just got approved um, a little less than a month ago. It's another cyclosporin, but it's using that same, not the same. It's using a, a very, it's a different, but another semifluorinated alkane, another water-free vehicle. It's not designed to stay on the eye for six hours. Um, like we just described with perfluorohexaloctane, because this one's goal is to try to get into um, the glands. So it's it's going to be, you know, one sixth at best of the same sort of thing. Um, all right, I'm texting them right now. There it is. It just went through. Uh, Adam. So I'm going to do this real fast. Let me do it this way. Uh, tell me about the semi-fluorinated alkane uh, risk of non-breakdown with my bowl. Okay. All right. So we'll see if that comes back in. He's usually really good at responding. So here's our newest one. Um, this is a, a different vehicle, but it's still semi-fluorinated alkane. But it's not perfluorohexaloctane. It's perfluorobutylpentane. 
Um, it works in a way that it allows the drug to get through. But what makes this one really novel is that's, that will now be the highest concentration of cyclosporin. I have to admit the 0.09% cyclosporin in a nanomicellular vehicle outperformed the original cyclosporin in my clinical experience significantly. It was definitely an upgrade. So this is going to be slightly higher, 0.09 to 0.1%. That's not a big difference. But would this new vehicle now help? Again, no pH, as Greg said, no preservative, because there's no water. The big advantage here is the tolerability. Uh, there were very few patients that described burning or stinging with installation. Uh, that plays a role. And then, of course, the penetration that comes in. At four weeks, you can see highly statistically significant improvement in staining. These are the average study results, even at two weeks. Um, as you can see, on the average, about three grades of improvement. And that was, um, you know, done at, at the in both essence one and two, and both were at four weeks. So this is a different cyclosporin in the sense that I've never seen that kind of speed of response uh, to things like corneal staining. Is it the vehicle? Is it the higher cyclosporin? Is it the combination of two that's playing a role? And it really wasn't a single symptom that wasn't improved by at least three grades, um, with every single category being statistically significantly improved on the right. Dryness, blurred vision, frequency of dryness, awareness of dry eye, reading, fluctuating vision, uh, looking at screens, driving at night, all statistical. The improvement in central corneal uh, staining, though, is probably the biggest standout for this new form of cyclosporin, where you can see that uh, blurred vision on the visual analog scale, you know, improved by about 34%, didn't move with the vehicle. Uh, and that, again, was related to that central corneal staining improvement. And that's what this is showing. Cure production, of course, that just Shermer's goes up. But the more impressive thing is the staining. We didn't get that with the original cyclosporin agents. And we certainly didn't see symptomatic improvement. That would be near 40% um, in the clinical trial. But I think what really separates this new one, and this won't come out until January, but that's not far now, is there was only... Um, 2.5% in the first trial, this is the phase three trial, and 9.9%, so somewhere an average of about 5% of patients that had any sort of burning installation site pain. And as you can see there, all but one patient, 0.2%, um, was mild. So this is a very unique tolerability profile very similar to the perfluorohexaloctane in terms of being so comfortable, it's hard to know it's going in the eye. But as a whole, this one also has a drug with it. 86% of patients had at least one positive response. 78% uh, of patients rated that their satisfaction as neutral or positive. So it, it wasn't uh, not as high of a symptom score. Like patients on the perfluorohexaloctane really describe how comfortable it is. This one really had no adverse events more so than anything, meaning they didn't describe negative events, but weren't raving about how this is so comfortable in the eye. Well, I mean, there was positive events in 85%, so I don't want to say it wasn't the case, but not to the same level. So fluorinated alkanes have a lipophilic uh, perfluorinated component or lipophobic, that is, that shoots for the air, and then the highly lipophilic alkane that needs to anchor within your lipids. Uh, 60 times longer residual time on the eye than current cyclosporin agents. Um, but that's not near what the perfluorohexaloctane, the last one, had on the eye at six hours. But still very impressive drug. Uh, Reproxilab just got a delay by the FDA. Um, still in investigational trials, but mm -hmm. another drug that we're likely to see in the year 2024. Um, it's the first in class reactive aldehyde species. Reactive aldehyde species are very upstream. This is almost like a steroid anti-inflammatory without the side effects. That's probably the easiest way of describing it. It's working pretty close to that level. Uh, no IOP rise, cataract development noted in the clinical trials. Um, but it has an icy hot kind of sensation when you put it in the eye. So it's activating the TRIP8 receptor, which does stimulate some tear production. Uh, reactive aldehyde species are pre-cytokine system-based mediators of inflammation. So this is working very upstream, up where we typically would have a steroid work. Um, so it should work in all forms. One of the really unique aspects of this drug is it also met its primary endpoints in phase three 
for allergic conjunctivitis. Now, you're not going to see it likely marketed for allergic conjunctivitis because it doesn't get covered by payers. You have to go over the counter. But it did complete the trials, and it's in the final phases. Or uh, FDA wants one more trial for dry eye. So you'll have a two-category drug, a drug patients who have allergies with dry eye. This may be the drug for them called Reproxilap is the drug, and it's likely to be four times a day also. That's what they studied, or up to four times a day. Um, from before. And sorry that I missed, I didn't hit send here. With my bow, there we go. Okay. So you see it works at the level just above corticosteroid cyclosporin lafitagrass, has very similar anti-inflammatory in both cytokines and T-cell activation and inflammation. The, uh, the, the cytokine uh, suppression data is very powerful in the mouse models, but the human models are really what we want to look at. And they're able to, uh, tending to submit the new drug for application, likely to get approved at some point in 2024, but they hit their primary endpoints for their crossover trial, their allergy trial, and then they have one repeat dry eye trial, but they also had symptoms, dryness, discomfort, grittiness, stinging, burning. So Greg, uh, Joe, need for a drug that might work at a steroid level, but doesn't have side effects? I mean, if it is as efficacious as steroids, that's great. Because one thing that we don't, I think, as clinicians communicate well enough are the risk and adverse events uh, with steroids. And patients aren't aware of that, that they can get a cataract if they have their own crystal lens, or it can cause a super infection, or it can cause glaucoma. So these are things that uh, we take for granted, you know, if it's short term, but sometimes patients can get their hands on steroids long term, they can cause a problem, and you can end up with a medical legal issue if there's a failure to warn. So if you can get something that works at the level of the steroid without having the adverse effects or above the steroids, it'd be great. Yeah. It's a dual mechanism. You're going to have the trip eight receptor activities. So you're going to get instant, um, you know, uh, activity of your lacrimal, your mucin, and your meibomian gland. So, you know, there are future drugs looking at that same model. Uh, this thing would preempt, but again, this might be late 2024. But their um, Shermer scores, of course, all hit their endpoints. Safety was good. Um, in fact, the it wasn't listed as a installation site pain or burning. It was a installation site sensation. That's an interesting label, but I think the FDA felt like um, it's not pain, it's not burning, but it is a sensation when you affect the trip aid receptor. Look at the pipeline for dry eye drugs. Not all will make it, um, you know, but some are working on different categories. There's three in phase three. Um, the fifth one down, Palatin has a drug that works on the melanocortin receptors. Have you ever heard of the drug Acthar? It's a very effective systemic disease modifying immunological agent or biologic. You inject it twice a week, subcutaneous in the peritoneal stomach area. And I swear people who I can't stop their keratitis or uveitis um, seems to regulate their body. It's kind of like oxer the uh, synergimin. You're putting in what's missing. You're putting in the melanocortin receptor um, agonists that are necessary. And I think that's what we're going to see with palatin, which is a melanocortant uh, receptor uh, agonist as well, that's coming out as a drop um, this year. So I should put that one in because it's only a year and a half away from approval, but I didn't want to go anything past 2024. We've also had nerve stimulation drugs. Those are long gone. Um, but now we've got, you know, a drop that you can apply in the eye uh, or in the nose, sorry, a nasal spray that will cause stimulation of mybum, as you see there, um, of mucin and of your lacrimal flow. But this one's showing the mybum. You'll notice how you get the oil slick at the end in the keratoscope. Um, but that's what we're seeing is the immediate response in these uh, new uh, type drugs that you spray. Now, the key here is you don't spray it way up here like your other sinus medications or stuff like that. It's meant to be right behind this crease. That's where the receptors are for the ethmoidal nerve that stimulates the parasympathetic pathway. Uh, this has been approved about two years, not even. Um, and again, it's another adjunctive. I've had good success in some of my Sjogren's patients with this, where they're just trying to produce some sort of tear production. They need it on an as-needed basis and are able to function. 
Number one side effect, probably about 80 to 90% of people who sneeze. Not every time, but they'll have at least one somewhere in there. This is the interesting fact. 34% of your tearing comes from just inhaling through your nose like I just did. There's a study where they anesthetized one nostril and not the other and found there was 34% less tear production in this anesthetized side. Uh, not the eye was anesthetized, the nostril. And full amount here. So they were able to show 34% of our basal tear reflex, not, not you know lacrimal, but basal, meaning mybum and mucin, as well as lacrimal, is nothing more than activating this ethmoidal nerve. And that's what their target was with this new drug where you spray it in there and the activity targets, you know, that ethmoid receptor, nicotinic receptor agonist, you're going to get activity of the parasympathetic, which then results in stimulation of all three uh, basal tear production. Reflex, uh, they're not reflexes, they're actually basal tear production. Have you guys used this? Nasal spray? Yeah, I have, Paul. And, you know, it's, I've, I have, I work right down the road from a five man woman rheumatology practice. And I get to see a lot of, you know, Sjogren's mixed connective tissue disease, Wegner's, all that fun stuff. And really, um, you know, the reps come in and I've tried really finding out a best place to use this. And you nailed it. The, the Sjogren's patients, you know, they like it, they'll use it. They'll continue to use it. Um, just the kind of that, early dry eye patient, they just don't seem to be you know, sustained on or maybe bad enough. So the Sjogren's is the person that I find it to work, but I like it because again, it's going back to the naturopathic, you're producing all the different layers of the tears in a natural way. So, you know, it's a cool, it's a cool process. It's just, I haven't been able to find a good, uh, uh, other than the Sjogren's patient. That's fair. I, I agree, Paul. It's not one of my, it, it is not one of my standard therapies or go-to therapies. Yeah, it's got its place in those patients. They love it. It gives another route. Um, the data is powerful, of course, as well. Um, you know, there are other TOS medications that got approved in the last two years as well. They actually increased. I never realized this. I always thought this is just cosmetic. You lift up the upper eyelid by two millimeters. But actually, patients showed almost a 30% increase in visual field superiorly, 28.2% to be exact. That's not, I mean... Some glaucoma patients, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe and Greg, but that's kind of what a person with an arcuate defect often can have or nasal step is somewhere around that percentage loss superiorly in an arcuate. That's per, that's a lot of vision that you gain driving and otherwise. Yeah, and even subjectively patients, you know, patients say, I when I lift my, I had a patient say, when I lift my lid a little bit, I see a lot better. Yeah, that's, that's, I get that too. And this lifts the eyelid two millimeters on average. That's, that's significant and statistical as you see here. And uh, there isn't a category or time frame. It didn't work. It works within three to five minutes. One drop lasts all day. Uh, but again, you got to use RVL pharmacy. You can't go through your CVSs and your regular ones. You got to go through there. There's a set price for it. In fact, this thing works so well. Sometimes if you have a patient like the top, left that's a congenital ptosis i found that when they put it just in their left eye it rose above the right eye and they had to put it in the right eye to make them the same again so it really does uh, <clears throat> affect it pretty significantly for these patients good safety and tolerability um as well hey paul as you're doing just continue along i want to launch a couple of your poll you probably have your hot oh. your slides hidden yeah um, I'm going to just launch a poll here. Just keep chatting. It's, I think this one's going to be on Demodex. So. Keep going. I'm going to go past this. Yep. Demodex blepharitis is best identified via having the patient look down while at the slit lamp, plucking lashes and observing in a microscope, debriding, looking for discharge in the tear film or as you twirl the lash around. What are your thoughts? <laughs> <clears throat> we've got a pretty good response here so i'm just going to end the mm -hmm. poll and share the results good job 90 percent i've really done a good job listening to the discussions and know where that works i'm going to go to one 
last. You do one. that. You keep doing that. I'm going to do one more while you're doing that. If it'll work. Please so. do. Yeah. Cause I'm trying to get to one other slide. I'm going to pick up. You keep going through what you're doing because we only had one Mixture. more approval that came out last month. Mixture. In clinical studies, perfluorohexaloctane was shown to inhibit evaporation. 50% of normal mybum, of what normal mybum would, equal to normal mybum, four times more uh, inhibition of evaporation than normal mybum, where it does not inhibit evaporation, rather it works on inflammation. Give it about another second or two for people to weigh in. And then again, everyone, this is the live. This is the interactive part of this. All right. I think that's good enough. Share the results. Yep. Four times more. Two thirds of the group knew that. Let's do one more. We don't need to cover anything else. We really have hit everything of real importance here. I'm going to hit stop share rather than maybe put my email address up if I can. You want me to do the other poll? Is that what you want? Yeah, let's do the other poll. I think that'll be fun. I didn't get into GA drugs, but that's okay. We kind of covered them already. How is varenicline administered? Oh, that's the last one we covered. The um, the one that was the the last drug, the, the, the receptor that works on nicotinic for dry eye, the one we talked about for Sjogren's syndrome, is it a topical ointment, a topical ophthalmic drop, a nasal spray, or an oral medication in rosacea patients? That's a good fourth poll. We've covered them all with that. Yes, we have. All right. A nasal spray, 82% got that. It was a good group tonight. They had high scores. They paid attention. They were definitely uh, earned their credit for two hours. Well, let's go. And maybe Joe and you guys have covered them. But if you have covered this, I'm going back. I think they're talking about my bow and, uh, and Demodex drop, which would be uh, X Dem V. Can they be used come commonly together? Um, oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, because you, I've never really seen cases where I'd have demodex blepharitis where I don't have MGD. I mean, I, they're there. And, and here's the interesting thing. Um, and this is public information, but I just saw released today that, uh, XDEMV, uh, the question on that load lanner has actually just completed their first, uh, phase two trial complete for MGD. Uh, so it actually does work together. So the question is, do I need both? Well, they work, they work differently enough that I think they're extremely compatible. And I will tell you, I probably have 50 patients on both to date. It just happens that all these Demodex blepharitis patients have MGD. And I'm like, well, we've got two medications. You have commercial insurance. One will be free. The other will be between 20 and $50. If they're not, then, you know, don't fill them if it's too much but almost all have gotten it in that range and they're on both. And I've had very, very good comments on both. So I think they're very compatible, but the question is, will one eventually do a lot of what the other is doing? But right now they are so different in their mechanisms and their activity. That is an excellent question. I, I do think they are compatible drugs. The uh, perfluorohexaloctane or MIBO, I tend to say use up to four times a day, as we talked about, most people are using it three or two. And the uh, XDEMV, as mentioned, the question is twice a day for the full six weeks. If you don't do full six weeks, the eggs and the nits uh, allow new Demodex to come back. So even though it'll clear things up fast, you need to use it for that time. And then I just have them use the perfluorohexaloctane or MIBO long term. Uh, question just rolled in. Uh, is it established that Demodex causes dropout of the MIBO immune glands? We don't have a direct uh, correlation in that sense. So very anecdotal. And, and thank you for who asked that. Um, 
there, there really needs more to be more research in it. So many times when a new drug comes out, that's when we start getting more and more research looking into it. But when I look at, you know, uh, my clinic's 100% referral based. I have over 800 positive diagnosed Sjogren's syndrome patients. I only say that to put it in perspective. It's a very rare advanced uh, dry eye center. I'm only seeing really the patients who have 90% dropout often get sent in. So I have a good size population, even though it's 100% anecdotal, it's just my observation. When I see patients who are down to their last 10% of glands on myography, it's almost always uh, Demodex presence in significant amounts, severe rosacea, or Accutane utilization, and in some rare cases, a severe exposure keratitis um, associated with it, where they just don't close their eyes. And so for that reason, they don't blink and they lose a whole bunch of glands. So there's four reasons. Uh, rosacea and Demodex overlap. So we might say there is even three. If I had to look at those really significant dropout patients with rosacea, most of them had Demodex. So I would say high concentration Accutane as a teenager, Demodex or inadequate lid seal leading to exposure where the eyelids just never touch again are really the three but Demodex seems to be the most common of the reasons. Again, I need to publish it, need to research it, need to take all my patients with only 10% glands and do the analysis. But someone from that, their company can do that. That's what they have their medical people for. But um, I think that would be good to have an establishment because it's not scientifically yet correlated. It's pretty much anecdotal, like I just described. And it's probably also, you know, in medicine, we like to be linear or binary, right? Does the Demodex cause the dropout? You know, why did the Demodex have an overgrowth? It was, you know, it's probably more of a syndrome that's occurring. It's probably a cascade. It's probably more of a complex system that the Demodex is there plus something else, plus something else, and then you get the dropout. So that's probably why it's hard to do these probably causations because it's probably more of a more complex system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you know, so another one rolled in. Uh, maybe we need Tracy on this one, but Paul, you might know it or Joe might know it. Uh, Tracy's the pharmacist we lecture with, but what do you consider as too high a dose for Accutane? Yeah, you know, there are some papers um, that look at it. And the reason why I like this question is that in probably the last five years, dermatologists and others have recognized the damaging effects of high dose. And uh, so they've really come down to, to low doses um, of patients. Like, for example, um, you know, if you go back 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't uncommon for them to prescribe one to two milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, so that, you got to weigh that out, of course, by the, by the teenager and where they're at. And today, you know, most of the times they're doing a half a milligram. So it's like one fourth of the concentration. So they're hoping that that decreases some of the things that we're seeing. Um, but, you know, it does take a fair amount to, to affect it. Meaning it, when you get to those low doses, about 50% of patients don't get um, enough effect and 50% get cleared. So you, you, they often end up going up or creep up a little bit. But, uh, but if I'm not mistaken, um, I think the cutoff is somewhere um, around 80 milligrams per day um, is kind of where the, the, the high concentration comes in and, uh, and then 40 milligrams. So this for an average teenager, 40 milligrams um, and under is kind of what they're looking at now. So that wasn't a great answer. That's just based on old data, but I think that's, that's probably your max probably around, even though they used to do two milligrams is like the actual maximum therapeutic dosage 20 or 200 i think uh, 200 i say the i think 80 is kind of where you start to have significant effects but every patient's different so there's some better answer out there but that's an overview answer you know a question rolled in here is it safe to say that these conditions can be attributed to part of aging being a comp uh, uh because uh compensating physiological defenses are compromised um, you know, I'm going to say, again, it probably goes back to that, you know, bigger picture 
Um, you know, there's probably, you know, a poor diet, a leaky gut, a uh, broken immune system, underactive, overactive immune system, um, you know, aging as part of that, our environment, our smoking, our exercise habits, our sleeping habits. You know, it's probably when you say aging, it's probably, you know, you know, all this stuff that we kind of talked about tonight was tinkering with the immune system. We're either something is upregulated and we're trying to downregulate it or we're trying to stimulate or replace or do something with that immune system. So one of the biggest things I always tell people, here's something, you know, which do you prefer, Restasis, Zyadra, or Sequa? They're all going after the immune system where something is upregulated. Um, so, uh, you know, that's probably my answer there is, you know, it's, it's, it's the immune system is either over or under reacting in a lot of these things from multiple reasons. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I, I remember a paper, though, from many years ago that or might have been a presentation where they were looking at Demodex that basically said it was very age dependent, like age 50, about 50 percent of people will have some cholerets indicative of Demodex. By 60, it's 60 percent. By 70, it's roughly 70 percent. By 80, it's roughly 80 percent. I don't know how scientific that was, but it stuck in my mind is that's kind of interesting that it does increase with age. Um, is that change in immunity? Is that just build up over time? Is that all the factors Greg described? Yeah, I don't. I don't think we know. It's probably a little combination of them. Well, we're gonna pause there with the questions. Um, we'd like to end these right at ten o'clock, and I have some uh, um, uh, housekeeping to do here. Paul, you know, such a wealth of knowledge, such a pleasure, such a you know the conversation back and forth between you know me, you, and Joe. Um, again, we try to um, make everyone a little bit better in clinic. That's Joe and I's kind of, I guess, mission statement. And we can certainly, I think after this lecture, people will feel more comfortable with all these pharmaceuticals going into clinic tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah, so much, Paul. Really thank you very much. Happy holidays. Thank you guys for the opportunity. And thank you to all who are on the Thanks. webinar. Happy holidays, Paul. Thank you. And you're giving you a virtual round of applause. So you want to check the chat room, go right ahead, or you can uh, have a good night. All right. So, Happy holiday. Thank you. Uh,